Hello, and welcome to another conversation about conversations. I am your co-host, Jacob Kubrak. With me, as always, is the man, the myth, the legend, the author, the podcaster of conversations about conversations, and our lady legend, Jules Swisher. And today, we have a special guest, Mr. Michael Van Sant. Hi. I feel like there should be some applause with that with that introduction. That's 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 editing afterwards. You'll hear yeah, that. you can put that just, in. Just like the the the, the baseball games <laughs> and the green room <laughs> and the football. Yeah, I love it how my team. I love it how my team, uh, even though there's no fans, they put in the booing. The booing is still there. <laughs> I have a I have something to reveal to the three of you and our listeners. Any interest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, obviously. So I love no, the tea. no, don't do it. <laughs> no, give me the tea. I hey, you know I love it. Hey, that's a conversational technique right there. All right, so that's called dessert tray, but we'll we'll do that in another episode. Would you like to see the dessert tray? <laughs> of course. I was almost named Van. Oh wow. And I was thinking about the, that this morning with Michael Van Sant. I would have been Van Farber. Okay. <laughs> but you are named Van. Well, like. Just I Van. Yeah, there's Van. <laughs> I, I Van Farber. Yeah. It'd be like, it'd be like Byron Von Farber. <laughs> I think it would have changed who you are, just your name alone. I think. Like the Johnny you... Cash song, uh, Boy Named Sue. Yeah. <laughs> Right, just like that. If if you don't buy a farm and become a farber farmer, <laughs> <laughs> nothing will be right. Yep. When I sometimes do like a name introduction, this is a concept I learned in Dale Carnegie, where you give people a picture. So I usually say Ivan Farber, like a white van with a big eye on the on the side of it and a farmer and a barber in the front seat. <laughs> I van far burr. And, the, con and the conversation still continues after that? <laughs> oh yeah. Or, or I simply say Ivan the Terrible. <sighs> Ivan the Great. But it got, me, it got me thinking about your names with Van. Now, like if, if Michael, if you were Van, if your first name was Van, you'd be Van Van Sant. I could be Van Squared Sant. Yes. Uh, Baron Von Swisher. I like the I like the sound of that. Or Baroness Von Swisher. Yeah. Van Kubrick. <laughs> yeah. You, you could put a van in front of anything. Yeah. Let's do I it. I like that. I, I think our work is done here today. Let's just yeah. Yeah. Let's, that's it. That's the episode. Names. This episode right, about managing up was brought to you by Van. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, I can tell the natives are getting restless. <laughs> and the, the acronym for the episode is also VAN. Oh, we're going to have to fit that in. Yeah. All right, the, the episode is the <laughs> third part in a three-part series called How to Manage Up. Part one was about the all-important first conversation with your manager or meeting with your new manager. The second episode was about handling criticism, six ways to handle criticism from your manager. And this episode is going to be more general and generic about managing up. So we're going to talk about the definition of managing up, like what is it? Because I think we know what it is, but I think we'll deepen it. We'll peel the pomegranate a little bit. We'll talk about why it's important. I mean, I think it's obvious, but I never, I always know if you think you're, something's obvious, it might not be. We're gonna tell stories about experiences with managers, like to make this real. The, the ground rules are no names of managers, no companies of managers. It can't be of your, at your current workplace. So that should, should protect us. And then we're gonna give some ideas. Like it'll come out of the conversation, but we'll we'll get some ideas for you. So that's that's the ride you've signed up for. <laughs> Where's All the chicken board. exit? Where's the chicken exit? 
All my stories were about my current manager. So I had to. I'm yeah, I got nothing there. for you now. Yeah. So we can just tag them in the post. Perfect. <laughs> They'll love yeah. that. Can this be the conversation instead of having the conversation with my manager? I just sent him this a recording of this podcast. Mm hmm. Definitely. Can you can tell the Jewel said it's fine. You're going to hear from Lee. Mm -hmm. Mike, how many managers have you had approximately? Uh, I think we, but as we were talking before in the green room, um, I was going to say a lot. Uh, I've had six jobs since I graduated college, but probably just one manager. No, that's not true. Probably about 12. Cause, cause even though I've only worked for six companies, I've worked in multiple locations, especially in the early, early jobs. I probably worked in three, three locations each, which brought different managers. Jacob, I'm curious how many managers you've had. So I, I started work very young. I mean, if we're counting like restaurants and bus oh, yeah. boys and, and yeah, things count like them. that. Oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's gotta be like 15 plus somewhere. Right. And I mean, a lot of those people, there's a lot of turnover at those types of places and um, yeah. Restaurant. Jules, what about, general. what about you, Jules? I've had four in my professional career and about six in my barista hostess waitressing professional career. <laughs> So, okay, so if I'm going to do the math, I think that'd be 10, but it's still early. So correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I went back to, I went back to my first job ever, which I was a camp counselor. I counted, I counted that. But I've had 24 managers in 26 years. Well, it's more years than that. I've, let's say I've had 23 managers in 26 years, something like that. Either way, more than 20. And I had some early ones that really helped me learn how to manage up because this was actually not my tour mentor, but my, what I call my tender mentor <laughs> because she was such a tender manager to me and mentor. Like, and it's, I find it's rare that you have that overlap that the mentor and the managers, it's very rare, but, but she, she was definitely both. And I watched her manage up, not just to her immediate manager, but the manager's manager and the manager's manager's manager was very impressive. So I, I, I really feel grateful. I learned a lot early on. I was thinking, Ivan, with our relationship, Ivan and I have been coaching each other for 16 years or so. You've known some of my managers personally, worked with them, coached them. So uh, we have a little, little background there. One of the reasons why Mike and I are are in communication every every Friday morning since Jules was in kindergarten. <laughs> Jules, think about that. I, I am. I am. Yeah. I'm I thought about it a lot of times too. Um, so we've heard about each other's managers because we've never worked. Well, I shouldn't, I'm that's incorrect. We once worked at the same company 20 years ago. But we've, we've stayed in contact and coached each other. And one of the benefits of the coaching relationship is that we're not in each other's families and we're not at the same workplace. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to really, uh, there's a lot of value to that, a lot of value. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you, uh, are we considering coaches from sports as managers as well? I, it, you know, as, as you all were talking, I, I thought about it. I have to double or triple my number because uh, because of that. Like I had managers, then I had sales managers. Sometimes, you know, at some jobs you kind of have managers slash coaches. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted, I offered to be a, a coach at my current company, but they said, no, you got to be a manager. And um, so, I mean, they're, they're mentors versus managers. There's a lot of crossover in all of this. So I, I don't know. I won't be the, the defining person that answers that question, but I, I think there's definitely a possibility that you call them managers. You call your, probably I, I your agree. best managers coaches. Mm -hmm. I agree. If, if that's the case, then the number goes up. But all those things, those traits that the good ones have are inter, not intertwined, but interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I, picture, I picture this 
Venn diagram with <laughs> managers, coaches, and mentors. And if you could have that center of the Venn diagram, Jules, will you teach me how to do a Venn diagram on the, on the <laughs> edit in the video? Definitely. Um, if you can be in the center there, that is ideal. And so I think back and, and like I said, there's, there's a handful that of the 20 plus, maybe three or four have fit the bill, but, but one of we're flip, we're going to flip the script here. I'm going to flip the hat upside down because we are also, all of us are direct reports right now and in a client facing role. And we are the coaches, managers, and mentors to our managers. Now, it definitely flipped for me once I was older. You know, I started being older than my managers. But again, I come back to early on too. Well, I used to think I knew a lot more than I, I do now. So we all think that. So that's why Jules knows more than all of us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's why she's the most successful one in this whole <laughs> yeah, and can draw a Venn diagram, which, by the way, if we could go back to that Venn diagram for a little bit. Um, I think that 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 perfect spot in the middle there, that that that's what parenting is. <laughs> Ooh, Jacob, there it deep. is. This is deep. Yeah. And it's Sunday morning too. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Hmm. Strong. Jacob is a great advocate for conversations about parenting conversations. Yes. Well, that's and my daily life, right? I mean, I'm at that peak of six, eight you know, seven, nine year old. And it's just, it doesn't stop. But, but in, in life in general, right? Like t typically, right. If it's somebody who has all three of those, you know, coaching mentor manager, right. Has had can relate. And, and that's, you know, one of the big things there is, is being able to relate to people, but yeah, maybe some people listening might have kids. Maybe they don't, I don't know, but either way, if you do all those three, you're going to be a good, pretty good parent. Mm -hmm. Well, Jules, well, and I, and I, and I, I'm good. Ivan. Jules has a dog. You're yeah. Yeah. You're probably a great pet owner. Thank you. She Parents slash pet thing. owners. Yeah. Well, when you think about the impact and importance of a good manager, uh, I don't think it is more important than being a good parent. Like, I mean, that's really where you're going to have an impact. Um, and I, and I agree with you hundred percent, Jacob. I mean, hopefully the tools that we discussed today can be applied in any relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I'm waiting. So maybe, maybe I'm not tuning out till I hear him. Taking should notes be, should, should just be coaching up or mentoring up slash managing up. Well, the term that Ivan and I came up with just a long, long time ago is, is the ability to influence and I think influencing up, Ooh. it's just influencing up, down, sideways in the Venn diagram here <laughs> and there and here. Throw that in there. Is that five circles? Now we got the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, you're, you're quick. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So it is the definition of managing up, I think, is the same definition as managing, right? You're the direct report, but you are influencing, you're wanting, you're wanting something. You're wanting validation. You're wanting to be right. You're wanting power and power to be promoted if that's what your aspiration is. You're wanting a relationship that isn't, well, there's so many disempowering. Actually, I, I now think of more managers, but there was... So I was a bank teller. One of my first jobs also was being a bank teller. And while I had a branch manager who was my official manager, I had on the teller line, I was the only male on, on the teller line. And, and I was, I mean, I was like 20. And I remember how angry I was. The way they were treating me or the way I felt like I was being treated. Like I probably thought I was, hot stuff, like the cat's meow. And I was just this summer job and that was their job. And I remember I had a stamp, like you, you would pass, you know, all the money in out, you count your money, put in the same. And I had a, but I had a teller stamp on, on the deposits or whatever, or maybe on the bills. And this, this woman made me, she was my supervisor. So there's the branch manager. And she made me so mad that I was just 
pounding the my stamp like so hard. Um, but okay, so that one, what I wanted was a little respect. And by stamping hard, that's how you get it. I think we're done. Yeah, again. <laughs> so they had a drive through at this branch, like 300 yards away. Where do you think they put me? Uh uh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Actually. that's funny. So that's not effective managing up, as it sounds like. That's not, that's not what we're promoting here today. No. Okay. There's still work we, to be we, done. We want the opposite. I've, I've been pretty lucky to have some good people along the way and, and that have helped shape me. Um, and, and along the way, when you figure out who the good ones are, it's easier to see, you know, kind of what, what the, the bad ones do. And, um, and, 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 you know, that's just the way it is sometimes in life. You're going to run into all types of people and hopefully some of the advice we cover here will, will help in both types of situations. What, what makes a good one, Jacob? the Venn diagram there <laughs> we no, but you said the Olympic, you said you've had a good circles. couple of good ones so when they come to mind what is it that made them good well they're good listeners right they can relate um they've usually done the the, the role in some aspect or way right um it's very hard to relate to someone who's never done what they're asking you to do um mm -hmm. and and so the, those those are you know the kind of the good people traits i mean the, they're the same all the way through. They're usually positive thinkers. They try to help you. They understand that you're not going to be perfect at this and you're still trying to learn at, at all levels, right? No matter how long you do something, right? You can always try to do it better. Um, and, and that's just, you know, a, a part of being coachable as well, right? Because on the flip side, you have to be open to receiving good feedback and, and, and handling it and, and going about it the right way and, and so forth. I, gonna, I think, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm going to oh. tell everybody the actual secret at the end of the episode, but Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great hearing different people's perspectives because things pop back into my head. Like, it's just, they're good list. They're carrying an empathetic. And I think you said it, Jacob, it doesn't matter what role, whether we're being coached or coaching, being managed or managing, being parenting or parenting or being parented. It, I think those items need to be present for that center of the Venn diagram. They, they listen and they care. And, and that's, that's it. And it, it makes me laugh that I've got a lot of managers that had good messages, like what they told me, and, and this is only in hindsight, and matter of fact, almost years, if not decades of hindsight, that like their message was spot on, but how I felt they delivered it mm -hmm. um, was poor. So they, I didn't get the, I didn't get that they were caring. I didn't get that they listened. And so I didn't receive the message. The truth is in hindsight, I can look back and say, no, they were right. Uh, just how it was presented, dessert tray or no dessert tray, Ivan, um, might've had some effect on how it was received. Well, just keep in mind all the things that we're saying we want and wanted from them. We got to look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. and say, were we doing that? Because I yeah. think one of the things I, I said in episode one and episode two of this, of this series is managers are people too. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of empathy for them because it's not an easy job. I remember the time, I remember one manager, I was like, why don't, I was on this team and two of the members of the team would like disappear in the middle of the day for two or three hours. <laughs> And there's always there's always one or two members <laughs> on a team somewhere. And disappear. Rece the receptionist would call in on on our team line and say, "Is is so and so here today?" And we would be in the lurch, just like the receptionist and their clients were not had very little confidence that their their point person was there. So I remember sitting with him, and this is by the time that my managers started to see me as peers. So it was a while ago, but this manager saw me as a peer. And I was like, why don't you do something about it? And he's like, there's not much I can do. So everybody has this story about how powerful managers are. And we, I think we give them a lot of power that they don't actually have. Jules, I want to get your perspective from your, your stage in your career. About what makes a good manager or about what? Yeah. And, and what's the definition for you of managing up? 
Yeah, I like the concept of managing up. It's something I should definitely uh, learn learn to do. Um, yeah, I think, well, when I think about my good managers, it's always the ones who've done my job first. That's really important. They've got to have been there and have done that. Um, and it's, it's the ones who provide that constructive feedback who really see you um, and see see your defects and your assets and can speak to both of those things and has your best interest in mind. I think that's really huge. Like a manager that wants the best for you uh, or wants you to be promoted, want, like believes in you. All those things are, are really important to me and my best managers had those, had those things. Um, Managing up, I think, is about, again, recognizing that your manager is a person too. Like we put managers in a box and label it manager. And we just like dehuman. I know I do, we'll dehumanize them and see them as their role and not as the person that they are. And so I try to take a look at like, let's look at their career tra trajectory and see that like they weren't always a manager. They weren't born a manager, <laughs> did many things before this. And, um, and I think trying to make that connection on a human level is probably really important and probably something that I should do more of. Well said. I'm gonna add that one of the philosophies that has worked really well for me has been well, and this works well in any conversation, being on the same side of the table. Mm -hmm. So I very much, especially when I've worked in large organizations, I have a stated goal of making my manager look good yeah. and telling them one of my three goals, you know, it's like business goal, this business goal, this business goal, but also in the top three is making my manager look good, yes. which also means helping my manager avoid looking bad mm -hmm. because managers look bad to the people above them. There's very few people in anywhere in corporate world that don't have somebody that they report to. Mm -hmm. Like even a CEO reports to the shareholders mm -hmm. or stakeholders if it's not a publicly traded company. So we all have to be good about managing up. And yeah, this to me, the definition is managing. Like I know it, we're calling it managing up, but there's this mind shift that we're having in this conversation that we can all do a better job being managers, even if we're not managers. Mm -hmm. Like in all the jobs I've had, I've never been a quote manager. You like that bunny ear air quotes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never been a manager, but I've managed lots of things and people along the way. A lot. Okay. There's more to the Venn diagram, and it's definitely at least a four, a four circles. Maybe it's Olympics. Leadership. Manager, coach, mentor, leader. <laughs> hey, man, hallelujah. Is that what, I, I don't know. That's it. <laughs> no, it's an uncomfortable to be a mic, pause. Mic drop. Oh, that's a mic drop. Okay. Yeah. But... I make it, it's me and me and him or her against the company. Mm. Like I, I say, okay, so one of my goals, the third goal is to make my manager look good. And so that means being an expert on the organization, understanding who's above. Cause actually not only do I manage my manager, but I know that I need to help my manager with my manager's manager, manager's manager, manager's manager, like all the way up the hierarchy. So I think strategically with them, and like, for instance, when to do a CC on an email, mm -hmm. I'm not a big believer of BCCs because I like being upfront about who's getting what. So I'll, I'll more likely forward an email that I've, like, if I'm going to forward an email to my manager's manager, if I'm going to send one, I'm going to forward it to my manager, most cases. Or of course, very explicitly do the CC. Mm-hmm carbon copy <laughs> where where when do you cc your manager ivan well one whenever i'm sending something to his boss or almost let's say 70 percent of the time to his boss when i think that i'm going to need help 
Mm -hmm. And that's a key part of my managing up strategy is using my manager as a resource. Mm -hmm. And it may, it may seem like, like I'm taking advantage of my manager, but I, that's my job actually to get my job done, whatever I need to do to take advantage of my manager as a blocker and a tackler I need to do. So when I, it's not 70% that I copy them, it's more like 20, 15 to 20 when I at least, okay. If I send an email above them, it's probably Mm -hmm. like 70%. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to send an email laterally in the organization to like a different part of the organization, then it's going to be more like 15 to 20%. Because I usually I want the other person in the other silo to know that my manager's on this because like they take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. But also because I'm going to need help blocking or tackling. And I don't want to waste my time with the politics. And not only do I not want to waste my time with the politics, but I'm not particularly good at politics because I don't really like it. And it's very hard. It's very hard to influence people by email. And I did an episode way back in the fall. Well, that would be a year ago now about how people, how email is overused. People try to have a dialogue with managers on email or or colleagues. So it's when I need my manager to do some blocking or tackling. And because I'm strategic about it, and because in in my one-on-one meetings with my manager, I'll elevate a lot of the things that I'm concerned about. But again, it's me and my manager against the organization. And maybe not even against, but mm, yeah, against. Mm -hmm. Not talking about current job, of course. Not current job. Mm -hmm. Nope. No, but any organization needs, you need an alliance. You need a, you need a Jedi alliance to fight the empire. Mm-hmm. But the key is you have the exact same objectives as your manager. And, mm-hmm. But you have to, and this, okay. So I said, I was going to give the secret. The secret to managing up is ha- having great conversations with your manager, mm-hmm. having clear conversations with your manager. And that, of course, is my conversation model. Brought to you by conversations. How to manage your business relationships one conversation at a time. But that, that's it, right? Like if you create, if you create an alliance with your manager, create a powerful relationship in conversation, if you listen and learn, which we've talked about, if you really explore what what their needs are, like I've been known to once I start with a new manager reach out and say, what are, what are the challenges you're current, ha- currently having in this role? Mm-hmm. Which of course we all want our managers to tell us that, like, what are the challenges you're having? Cause we want them to remove them. And so again, explore, it's an open-ended question. What are the challenges you have? What are the needs you have? So it's needs-based. Then address the needs and it could be just listening. You could just listen to receive it. I've talked about this with on other episodes about well, there's a book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. It's way back. That book. <clears throat> right. You know it, Jules? Stupid book, yeah. Yeah. So men want to solve problems and the women want to just be heard. General is so stereotypical. I hate it. But it's such a stupid book. Go ahead. It is a stupid, it's a stupid book, but the concept is a lot of times we'll bring a problem to our manager and we don't want our manager to solve it. Vice versa, they'll have a problem and they might want to just tell us and they don't want us to solve it. So you, so that's where, whether it's dessert tray or, or what I'm also starting to call opt in, like letting people opt into wanting something. Mike, you and I talk about this a lot. Like we start giving unsolicited advice. We call it pie face. It's not even dessert tray. It's like, here's advice. Here's advice. Here's advice. Like, don't oh, shit on people. Yeah. Hey, this is a PG-13 uh, episode. Watch your, watch your mouth. We've had to remind like several of our past guests about, about that. And it's kind of hilarious. I well, love it. I think what you, but you may have said, and I may just have misheard you. Don't should on people. Yes. Is that what you said? Or did you go off the rail there? Well, I said that and I went off the rail. I don't Good. know. Good. <laughs> All right. So um, address 
there's a whole art to addressing, but in order to actually address, <clears throat> you need to find out the need. Mm -hmm. So pie face usually jumps ahead of actually exploring. And then resolve, sometimes resolve is simply making a, an invitation to, do you want me to help you resolve this? All along the way, it's agreement. And that's really part and parcel of the approach. It's needs-based. So you're getting agreement that you can probe for the needs. You're probing and exploring the needs. You're, once you have a clear, complete mutual understanding of the needs, then you can figure out how to address the needs. Then you can actually resolve. So there's agreement along, all along the way. So that's the main strategy on managing up. And then there's another tool, which we will talk about in our next episode, episode four, and that is using role play and conversation simulations in order to really be effective in managing up. Oh. Mike, you and I, in our, in our weekly coaching, we've done a few simulations, role plays. Mm -hmm. Is that an effective tool? Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's one of the most effective tools. It helps me with... I think my issue, um, I think it was discussed today, is that what happens if, if your manager isn't as experienced or hasn't done your job? Like we talked about all the things that make a good manager, but how do you manage up when some of your criteria that makes them a good manager aren't met? Mm -hmm. And I think, Ivan, that's where you helped. We've done some role play, obviously not in my current job, but in, uh, historically. Um, and, and maybe you can share your perspective, but I feel like we're role playing a conversation with a manager and I'm coming at it as a know-it-all. Like I'm, I'm coming at it. Like you don't, you don't know, you don't have the experience. You haven't done my job, you know, all these other reasons why you're not good. And so my, my ask or my connecting or my, um, it just comes from that perspective that, and it's dead before it's even begun. And Without role playing, I may think it's perfectly logical. Mm -hmm. Ivan, do you have anything to say about that? Thinking about role plays that we did in the past, like when I'm going to. I mean, what what comes to mind is it's one of my special talents mm -hmm. is role playing. Like on some of the some of the episodes, Jacob, that you and I started with, I tried to role play with you, and it it helps that you're playing a real person but yeah it's one of my special talents to go through with people and coach them on role play and I love those moments Mike when we're we're doing a coaching and we start role playing a, a convert an actual situation that you're dealing with and it's just like I zing you right away it's like boom I, I just hit you right in the right between the eyes on your forehead and you're like I can't believe, and by the way, that I, it's the same thing happens for me when, when I'm reversing it. It's one of the, it's one of the best coaching tools of all. And well, and, and you could almost do one sided role play and get some of that yourself. Like, Oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. What I'm saying. I think role play gives you perspective that you did not previously have. Yeah. Well, it's different in your head versus out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it just is. Um, yeah. I have often written out dialogues. Like I talk through, like I say this, they say that. That's, that's a real deep level. But the way to start it is you try to solve the problem on your own. And it's very difficult. These, these interpersonal conflicts that we have with managers or, or whomever in our life, it's really hard to have perspective on them. And that's, that's really the beauty of it. Like I have had over the years, actually three relationships like the, the one Mike and I have, where I've had a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday conversation with people who aren't in my family or aren't at my workplace. That in and of itself is a huge strategy for managing up because you have that feedback and mentoring and coaching from someone. I mean, like separating, separating out the Venn diagram is also something very important and useful. Yeah. Like going here, here's the coach and going here, here's the manager. And mostly managers are not mentors and are not coaches and are not leaders always. Mm -hmm. Like there's a whole anomaly. I've had a lot of managers who their title was leader 
and they, but they weren't either they weren't leaders or pure leaders, or they just weren't in a job where they were allowed to be leaders. I've had, I've had companies I've worked with where their title was leader and they just, they couldn't be, they weren't freed up. So that was a need that I saw as some way I could help them, free them up. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good wrapping, resolving spot. So this is the time where everybody gets an opportunity to speak now or forever hold their peace. Unless you invite me back. Then, then. Yeah. You, you hold the record. You're, you hold the record. Yeah. You're the Alec Baldwin of um, conversations, conversations about, about conversations. conversations. Yeah. Flatter. We got to get you a monologue. <laughs> the pressure's mounting. And tell us I, old Ivan stories. What was Ivan like? Yeah, that's what Jacob wants to know. Tell, tell before we wrap, resolve, one, one How Ivan long have you guys story. known each other? 20, 20 years. Yeah. 20, 20 years as peers. And then what do we say about 16 as peer coaches? Is that, how would you describe our relationship right now? Ivan? I just asked you a question. You can't, uh -huh. can't do that. You, you're, oh, you're not allowed to ask questions. Well, you're no, questions. you're no allowed questions. to do everything, but I'm going to decline just like you decline. I'm going to decline to answer what uh tell a story about some like an early memory of of me this is this is my life how about how you guys met we met so i haven't had a really important role at one of our at a, when we worked together that he was the face of a multinational financial advisory so back in the day instead of having um, subject matter experts present about bonds or retirement plans, or you name the, 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 the narrow slice of financial advice, Ivan was the presenter of everything. And that's, you know, that's, it's very different than how it's done today, but he was the face of this multinational organization. He presented to large groups and um, that's how I first met him. This was a face without facial hair and without glasses 20 years ago. Fresh yeah. face. Well, think about yeah. that. I mean, Ivan's Ivan's telling six-year-old, sixty-year-olds. You know, I mean, people of all ages, but including sixty-year-olds, how to how to solve a problem. Actually, this is this is exactly what we're talking about. Like, how did he do that effectively twenty years ago, when he was close to thirty years old? Advise people that are two to three times his age and get them to listen to him. And maybe. Maybe that is why it's so obvious of where he's evolved to today. Like he's been doing it for a long time. That's role playing as well, um, except for live and, and in person with no retakes. Yeah, yeah. But Jacob, I, I, that... I will share. I'll share a better story. So uh, after that, he he uh, the firm that I worked for hired him to help another financial services firm come up with a value statement, a mission statement, kind of work on branding and marketing. And uh, I think it was one of his, at least the way he tells me this story, it's one of his more challenging experiences in all his life. And uh, he often talks about the day that my manager, my, the owner of the company just said, just tell us what our value and mission statements would be so we could put it on. And I think Ivan was a little bit frustrated, like I could, but that doesn't really work that well. There was, there was a company that when I was self-employed that you brought me into and Mike, by the way, thank you so much. He's been one of my biggest promoters. Not only has he been on the show more than anyone else, but he's bought more copies of conversations about conversations than anyone else. Um, but you brought me into a company. Get. When you buy that many com copies, you just get on the show. <laughs> It's well, he's gotten, he's gotten coaching for, for 16 years. That's what he gets. All right. So uh, he brought me in to coach the, the person who's being groomed to be the head of the company. So the, the parent was the head of the company. The child was being groomed to take over. And it was the most money I'd ever made for the least amount of work I've ever done. Because some people are uncoachable. And I wasn't in the same city as this person. And they were supposed to 
and this is one of the challenges I've had with coaching is people are not really good at taking coaching, but I was supposed to coach this person every morning and they just weren't interested. They wanted coaching. They felt, I think they felt like they got something from the coaching assignment, but you have to be available. And this is again, coming back to managing up is we have to be available to our managers to be managed. And we have to be available to manage them, to listen to them, to be empathetic with them. But that was, that was a great experience, Mike. We learned a lot. We all did, you know, and, and that's, yeah. I think that's part of this conversation is that regardless of results, there's something you may learn how not to do it again. You know, I mean, that's, that's one thing I've learned over, over the decades of, of working is like, all right, that, that didn't work very well. And maybe instead of being a know-it-all, I should be a, a, a caring, empathetic person going into a conversation. That one I do have to remind myself of uh, regularly. Uh, that's some of the coaching Ivan gives me regularly. We, we keep peeling back the pomegranate of know-it-all, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, we've acknowledged Mike knows it all. And so we just keep coming back to peeling out all these little seeds from that pomegranate. It's full of them. Like Mike and I know each other's stories and bad we, habits, bad habits. Mm-hmm. And we're, and I think one of the things that helps the relationship is that it's, it's very open and it, and so when you're managing up in an organization, you might not be able to be that open with, well, that, with a manager. That, that, that is something that we talked about a lot of facets of a good manager, but I think transparency, you, you, you started going there with the CC versus BCC. I think transparency in relationships um, deepens them and mm-hmm. allows for, for an authentic, more caring conversation when you're yeah. transparent. And actually the better, uh, the better word is vulnerable. Vulnerability, I think, is if, if that's present in a relationship with kids, manager, you name it, I think it deepens and uh, can be better. But now that is a mic drop, dropping a mic. <laughs> on, that, oh, on that note of vulnerability, I want to thank the three of you and all of our listeners all of our friends and colleagues and frolics. Thank you for being a part of this conversation about conversations. Thank Thank you. you.